the field marketing manager uh, for Infor, and I have huge pleasure to introduce you to Anwen. Anwen is our senior vice president and you know general marketing man managing director at Info. And before we lose any more moments, Anwen, who are you? Where do you come from? Tell us your story, share your wisdom. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, thanks Ramana for the introduction and uh, um, so thanks very much for giving me the opportunity to to, to share a little bit of, of my journey and um, I, I wouldn't say it's been a conventional journey over the years. Uh, I, I actually grew up in the South Wales Valley, in the UK, in the South Wales Valley from a very working class background and um, I must admit that when I was in school I was very much into the arts, um, I was very much somebody that needed to know you know why do i need to learn that you know explain to me why that's going to be important to me and if i didn't get an answer then i i tended to sort of switch off which consequently meant that um from an education point of view i actually left school at 16. um very much an arts background needed to 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 get a job i found a job in a, with the a council a local council uh, dealing with public services and it was in the architects department of the heating and ventilating uh division of this particular council and i was on the board as a tracer so basically taking the designs that somebody else had actually come up with and the calculations and and transferring that onto the drawing board now this is pre-cad times I'll, I'll warn you all, I'm very old, so my journey's quite long as well. So pre, pre sort of use of technology to actually capture these things, drawing by hand as a tracer. And I, I quickly got to realize that actually, if I needed to get on, because I started to understand exactly what the role was doing, I actually needed qualifications and I didn't have any. So I could do the work, but not get paid for it or get the recognition for the work I was doing. So all of a sudden education became far more meaningful for me. So, so I signed up for a day release uh, to start off with. Um, I basically, I, I sort of scraped through maths when I was in school. And I can actually remember the lesson where asking the question, when am I, when is Pythagoras' theorem ever gonna be of, of use to me? And, uh, and I was just told, just learn it, you know, just learn it by rote. And that, I, that certainly didn't, didn't uh, apply to the way I learned things, but, but, when I went back to, to sort of college, the only course that was relevant to the work that I was doing, which was in an engineering department on the drawing board, was actually mechanical engineering. And um, I can also remember the, the, the teacher that I had then. He was the type of person that will stay with me. You remember your best teacher. And if you ask the questions, why, uh, why do I need to know that? Give me an example. He wouldn't just tell you why. He would actually show you and give many examples. And he just brought it alive. And to me, that, that's the way I knew that I would learn from going on. And I excelled when I was at college because it meant something to me. And I applied myself uh, to this. And over the course of three years from a day release, I actually um, uh, gained a qualification in engineering. And I can remember going to, to work when I, when I had the result. And I was told, actually, it's equivalent to A-levels. So during the lunch hour, I contacted the, the local university and actually said, well, I gained this qualification. I'm told it's equivalent to A-levels. This was an ordinary national certificate in mechanical engineering. And um, does that, you know, can I do something with this? So they interviewed me during my lunch hour. And by the time I went home to my parents that evening, I was actually signed up to, to go to university. They offered me a place on the spot. And this was to, to study mechanical engineering um, I opted for the five-year course because I wanted to have uh, time in industry. I didn't just want the theory, I wanted the practical aspects of this as well. So I actually signed up to do uh, uh, an honours degree in uh, mechanical engineering, and it was myself and uh, 70 lads on the course, which was wonderful. I had a wonderful five years in actual fact, great, great time, which also involves sort of stints in industry where I worked um, at the Royal Mint in Clantricent. Uh, we're sort of in the welding department and scraping bearings for machines, but also learning about different processes, lear learning about the, you know, the actual practical application, and also sort of involved with, with manufacturing as well. So I successfully gained a degree in, uh, honours degree in engineering, and then sort of, what am I now going to do with this? 
And I actually felt that I now had something to give back. And so I signed up for a postgrad certificate in education and actually uh, to become a lecturer. So the first job uh, that I actually uh, uh, entered into from an education perspective, however, was, uh, was in a secondary school. Now, bearing in mind, I left school at 16 with no real qualifications at all. And the, the, the role that I had in secondary school was to teach maths <laughs> and uh, computer science. This new, new subject that was called computer science. And this was a sort of bur burgeoning time uh, during that time in actual fact. And I I'd spent sort of eight and a half years and uh, finished off the sort of head of department for, for computer science. But this also, do over that time there were many things that happened in my life uh in fact and one of them this was probably a dark time and lots of lessons to be learned uh, at, at this point um i actually my marriage had broken up i had to move home i then needed to earn more money so i could get a mortgage um so i changed jobs left behind all of my network etc to start a new job and I actually was at a very, very low period in my life. All right. Now, Romana, you know, I'm a champion for uh, people well-being and uh, mental well-being in particular. And the reason why is because I've been there. All right. And I think and I can empathize when you see people that are on the outside very positive, but actually you never know what's happening on the inside. So I think this is something that we should talk more about. But back to the story. Um, at that time, this was sort of, my, sort of one of my first lessons in actual fact that I had. I was at a very low ebb and there were so many things that were wrong in my life and it became overwhelming. And I realized in actual fact, the only way that I was going to sort this out was by having a plan. So I sat down and I analyzed, OK, so what are the good things? What are the pros? What are the cons? What are the good things? What are the bad things? What are the things that are within my control I can actually do something about? All right. What are the things that I'm worrying about that actually I've already gone? You've made those mistakes. So draw a line, you know, be kind to yourself, draw a line, forget about that. And actual fact that things that you're worrying about in the future haven't even happened yet. So forget about them. Focus on the here and the now. And that's how I sort of got my life back, back together again, came up with a plan, understood exactly what I needed to do. And one of the things was I needed to leave teaching. Uh, I'd reached that point that I, I was very, very unhappy in actual fact. So I went back to engineering and actually um, left, left teaching and joined my first software company. And this was a company. Um, they were developing a, a new software product that was aimed at the consulting engineering marketplace. So they were looking for somebody with that background, um, somebody with a background in co computing, this new sort of topic that was there. And of course, I'd been head of department and somebody who could sell. And it's like, well, anybody can sell. I'm sure anybody could sell. So I landed this particular job and this was my my first sort of uh, entry into the software, my software career. And I actually stayed there for eight and a half years. So. We, I helped them develop the product. I helped them launch the product to the market. I made the very first sale of this product. And over that period of eight and a half years, um, it actually became the leading uh, solution for project costing and billing for, for engineering companies in the UK. All right, so, so it was a huge success. And that company grew um, and to the point that they were then looking for a sales and marketing director. So I actually put myself forward. So. Uh, are you keeping up with me at this point, uh, <laughs> Ramana? Yeah. And um, so this was the point that I would probably say I hit my first glass ceiling. I know this is something that you were keen for me to talk about. And this is a strange one, especially for the ladies on the call, because the managing director at that time was a female managing director. Now I'm going back into sort of the uh, late, late 70s now. And um, she actually stated to me, which would be illegal in these days, that being a female managing director, even though I was the best person for the job, she needed to have a male sales director. And the assumption was that I wouldn't do anything about that. So this, you know, this was a, a company that was very close to where, where I actually lived. So they, you know, from a convenience fact, all of these things. And she made the assumption that I wouldn't actually leave. And that again was where I stopped. And there's another lesson here is to value yourself all right and 
I knew that I was good enough for that particular job. And I knew that this was a sort of a crossroads in my career that I needed to, to actually do something about it. So I actually resigned. And that actually opened up new opportunities for me. Um, I went to work for a company called Cognos. Obviously, they've, they've now been, been acquired. Um, spent some years there gaining an international experience. Uh, from there, I went to, to work for a, a company called Hyperion. Uh, again, these should be names that are familiar. Both of those organizations deal with data analytics. So, you know, focusing on outcomes, very, very important in today's uh, age is to, you know, understand the, exactly the, the insights that having access to core data provides for you. So it was a great grounding that I actually had there. And, and um, I spent a few years there, gained a lot of international experience. And then a company advertised what they were looking for somebody to, uh, this was around the time of the dot-com era. Uh, and this was a company based in Bristol called Aggresso, Aggresso Limited. And this was a relatively small company at the time. It was only about 23 uh, uh, um, full-time uh, resources that were there, turning over roughly about two and a half million at that point in time. So I joined, joined as a salesperson. And um, over the years, right, so this is a company that grew. Um, they were they were in uh, it was a, a Norwegian based company again project costing and billing going back to to my my previous role so I felt very very comfortable um, actually selling these solutions and um, they were actually acquired by uh, a, a, a larger organization Unit4 Business Software now this might be a name uh, that you are familiar with so Unit4 came in acquired Aggress Aggressor Limited. And I was now part of um, a global organization, headquartered in Netherlands, but a global organization. And this is a company that grew through acquisition. So, so again, I was actually with this organization for 18 and a half years. Started off in a sales role, moved out to become sales manager. When they acquired other organizations, I became the overall sales and marketing direct, uh, director over these organizations. And then I got to a point where um the current managing director of the uk actually for for personal reasons needed to step down so so he announced that he would be leaving in 12 months and i was actually asked to put my hat in the ring uh, to become the managing director and it's not some something that i had uh, sort of considered at the time but again when i evaluated it and um this might be something that a number of people are familiar with especially especially the ladies on the call um do you have a little voice in your head sometimes, ladies, and indeed gents, let's not be sexist about this, that says, oh, I'm not sure. Am I good enough? Do I know enough? Um, and do you actually talk yourself out of doing something even before you've actually started it? All right. Because that little, little voice in your head. So again, over the years, I've learned to control that little voice in my head. All right. To, to be, and the way I do it is by looking at the pros, looking at the cons, learning from my experience of where I've come from, doing that sort of analysis, and then actually thinking, what's the worst that could possibly happen, all right? If, if you, you know, a public speaking engagement, am I gonna, you know, fail for worry? So what? I've learned from that experience, all right? So lesson there, um, the imposter syndrome, sometimes they talk about this. There are coping strategies to enable you to actually overcome that. And this is how I actually do that is by saying, do you know what? I'm going to do it. If I fail, I'm going to be kind to myself and I will learn the lesson from that. And the next time I'll actually do it better. All right. Because as all, we all know, you know, the, the best innovations come, come from failure. The best sort of, you know, successes. How many failures came before that success was yeah, realized? Ivan, yeah. So we only a have, key lesson to be, to be learned. We there. only have so three minutes it, left. I went through... Um, a very sort of comprehensive selection process uh, it, it yeah. involves an external yeah. organization to do the assessment because they needed to be sure I, I was up for the job. Um, yeah, three, three Ron, minutes to go. Are you, you're telling me about my time. Yeah, brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, let's, let's crack on. Uh, anyway, I, so I became, <laughs> I became managing director. But what I actually made sure was that A, um, I had the support network. I've never done this beforehand. Make sure I had the support net network. Uh, I also, because I didn't know what I didn't know, I made sure I signed up for relevant courses. 
um, because it's quite scary when you realize the responsibilities of, uh, you know, when you take a form of directorship as well. So I made sure that I had the skills behind it, but this strong network. And the next thing that I needed to do was to replace myself. Well, it was the sales and marketing director. So I needed to build a team around me. All right. And I made sure that I wasn't replacing myself. I knew what my skills were, but I looked for teams of complementary skill sets. All right. People who could do what I couldn't do. And that then drove the success of that organization even further, faster and further. All right. So after 18 and a half years, um, private equity came in. Uh, lots of changes took place. And I decided, OK, now's the time for, for me to leave. I then joined uh, another global organization, Technology One, uh, based out of uh, Australia, in fact, and that was to lead a turnaround. So again, you build a culture, you understand all of the issues there, you talk to people, you communicate, you have a clear, clear strategy. Because if you haven't got a clear strategy, how can people get behind you in a line, all right? So that's absolutely another lesson there. Make sure you have clarity and you communicate, communicate, communicate. So I turned the company, that company around within sort of three years, and that then brings me to where I am today at Info. So I've been on with Info now for just over, uh, just over 12 months in actual fact, and uh, I'm hoping I'm bringing all of the lessons that I've learned previously to bear. But Romana, you're probably the person that should be able to answer that. You know, hopefully we're building a culture, we've got clarity of the strategy, we're collaborating, we're aligning. And I must admit my role in all of this now is to make sure that everybody else is successful all right the role of a leader make sure you know i want to make myself obsolete so the company drives forward uh, together so that's it hopefully that was useful yes that was very useful uh i still can't hear you Ramona. <laughs> are you talking yes i'm talking but uh i don't know i think we had uh, can you hear me <laughs> maybe anyway that's it <laughs> yeah just a moment uh so i'll stop sharing now as you can see we worked together on uh well trying to share Andren's story thank you so much for being here we were over 70. i will try to connect with you i hope i caught a few of your emails but let's repeat her session what were the seven five five seven lessons which he was mentioning so i'm really grateful that she's here our leader uh, at our company at Infor. but number one stay curious be a lifelong learner number two forget the past forget the future focus on now and what you can change number three control the voice in your head learn from mistakes there to try new things number four be brave know your worth don't settle for less. Number five, build a strong network, learn from great mentors. And then bonus, she got two. It's have a clear strategy and know your destination. And the last one, stay humble, be authentic. So I'm learning from Anwan. I post beautiful things on LinkedIn. Thank you so much for being here and enjoy your day. Bye. Thank you.